Anybody want to sing? <laughs> I'm up next, I reckon. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I enjoy singing these hymns that teach us wonderful Bible truths and has so much to say. Uh, turn to the book of Acts, if you would. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I want to share with you the conclusion of this chapter. Freed from jail to be beaten. We've seen in this chapter that the apostles are affirming the truth. Uh, the court had met and commanded them uh, to be quiet and not to speak. The Sanhedrin met and what were they going to do? This was the supreme court of the land as the Sanhedrin told them not to, to speak in his name. And Peter gave us a wonderful truth if you remember in verse 29 when he said, We ought to obey God rather than men. How important it is for us to realize that our priority is to obey this book. Now again, there will come a time, I believe, in the days to come when we see more and more hostility toward Christians to do what is right. We've seen through the years that Christians have taken a stand to obey God. Not disrespectfully, not rudely, boldly, yes. But as we see that uh, God would bless Peter as he stood. And often the consequences come as we choose to, choose to stand and obey the Lord. And that's what Peter did as he shares with them. I like the two words that he uses for the Lord in verse 31. He calls him the Prince and the Savior. Now remember the word Prince there. It means the, the author, the captain, the Prince, according to Strong's. Uh, Wearsby says it means a pioneer, one who leads the way. And certainly God, our Prince, will lead us into areas of the Christian life that we've never been before. But He has promised to guide us. And you know, as I think about the last two years, hearing from our missionary this morning and all of our missionaries uh, as they have all faced this pandemic as we have, and they're, we're all trading stories. Well, well, what have you faced and what have you done? And, and all of us share the same common denominator. We've never been here before. We didn't know how to face this. But what a wonderful truth that God guided us through and He will continue to guide us in the days ahead and lead us as our pioneers we follow His advance and His leadership. Isn't it wonderful to know to follow somebody who's already been there? And God's already been there uh, this year, next year, and the year before. And we just need to follow His path and His leadership. Well, then he does something that stirs up the anger of the people there when he calls God our Savior. In other words, he's the Savior and he wants them to repent. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't go very well uh, with this religious crowd as uh, repentance is a change. Someone said it's a change uh, of attitude that results in a change of behavior. It's an about face. And here we see as uh, Peter continues to give them the gospel and he speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how that Jesus rose from the dead and gave his life for them, died upon a cruel cross. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we see that uh, this was already committed uh, verbally by Peter and John when he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What a wonderful truth. Jesus said, I'm not one of the ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, and then interesting enough, Gamaliel stands up in verse 33 of this uh, chapter 5. And of course, he was a very familiar Bible teacher, or not Bible teacher, but a uh, Jewish teacher in that day. He was a Pharisee. In fact, Paul would tell us in uh, Acts 
uh, that he was trained under this man. And Gamaliel proceeds to give uh, what we believe some uh, false... Uh, uh, truths as far as how to deal with these men. Uh, he tells them first of all in verse 36 that uh, these men are guilty by association. And he mentions the two uh, Jewish people that led revolts against the Romans. And uh, he said, well, these men, uh, it's going to come to naught uh, just like these other two men uh, that uh, he more or less uh, tells them that uh, uh, they're, they're just like all these others. When in reality, we know that uh, they are not like these other men. Jesus died upon the cross once, and there's no way uh, that uh, these men were speaking of a resurrected Savior. There's no way that these men were speaking of, as Peter said, we, we've seen Jesus. We, we witnessed uh, uh, His resurrection. Uh, so then he tries to say history repeats itself in verse 38. Then he tries to say if something is of God... Uh, it uh, is not of God. He said it must fail in verse 39. Well, again, we see that uh, there's been false religions that have been propagated and pushed for centuries, uh, and they still are around. And then he has a no-commitment <coughs> attitude, more or less a, a don't commit to these men. Uh, in other words, instead of investigating the truth and finding out where, what they were saying was the truth, uh, he says, well, let's don't commit. Uh, when in reality, if he would have just stepped forward and investigated. In other words, someone said this, uh, fear of taking a stand will harm us instead of helping us. And what it was that Gamaliel was afraid of taking a stand in investigating the truth of what Peter was saying. And often we find that people are, are like that. Instead of coming to the uh, truth and saying, let me hear the truth. And I think it's a sad day in which we live when people have become so one-sided, whether it be political or spiritual or even what is right. They don't want to investigate or even check into the truth. But as Gamaliel is through speaking and the Sanhedrin has decided, well, we won't take a stand on these men. We'll just beat them and let them go. And notice if you would in verse 40, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Hmm. And they departed from the presence of the council, of course, of disciples, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple... And in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. I want to call your attention, first of all, to their persecution. Their persecution. Now notice these men had been arrested once, set free by the angel. They were found again, arrested again, brought before the Sanhedrin, listened to their plight and what Peter had said, but this time, instead of letting them go or the angel interceding for them, God allowed them to be beaten. And here the Sanhedrin thought that they had shut these men up. Sometimes we suffer for doing right. As we understand that you and I have the truth of the gospel. And this truth that we have, the world does not like it. Satan does not like it. We are in direct opposition to the world, to the flesh, and to the devil. And even as we see these men were beaten. Now how bad they were beaten, we don't know. But I believe it wasn't just a little slap on the back. It was our persecution. 
to understand that Satan is in opposition to what we are doing. You know, as I was standing near the back, and I was looking over the table there of all those missionaries, and I was looking at all those missionaries, I thought to myself, what do all of these missionaries have in common? What do they all have in common? Now we know they have in common that their desire is to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. As they have gone to the four corners of the world, as we could say, uh, north and south and east and west, to countries, to people, not knowing their language, not understanding their cultures at times. Uh, what do all of these people, all these missionaries, all the missionaries that we have on our table back there, the list that we support, uh, they have in common that they're going to give the gospel. But there's another common denominator. It's called persecution. No matter where they go, no matter where they went, there was persecution. I think about Hudson Taylor as he went to share the gospel and the persecution that he had not only from uh, the natives and the people in the country that he went to but even the very mission board that he was with as he had to change mission boards. I think about Darlene Rose as she went to New Guinea to share the good news of the gospel. And as you know, World War II broke out and she was arrested and put in a concentration camp. And, and for five years she stayed there. Persecution uh, from the Japanese. They were probably uh, of the enemies in World War II who were the most fierce uh, as far as persecution. And, and I know the Holocaust was terrible uh, as far as the Germans. It was all terrible. Uh, I think about David Livingston as he went to Africa to share the good news of the gospel and the persecution and the difficulties that he faced. Uh, I was reading about the occasion, you remember, uh, when he was attacked, not only by the natives and the people who refused to hear, but even the, the natural predators and the uh, things that Satan would use to try to hinder the gospel. And it tells about the story when he was attacked by a lion. And as he was uh, loading his gun and the natives that were with him and the lion uh, attacked him and uh, he had shot it, but it, it mauled him. And then the other natives came to rescue him and another man was attacked. And uh, for the rest of his life, he was scarred and, and showed evidence of the attack uh, of this lion. Again, I think about Adoniram Judson as he went to Burma to share the good news of the gospel, how that he was arrested and thrown in prison and there and from prison and his wife came to visit with him to plead his case and how his body was uh, dwindling down because of the difficult things that uh, he was facing there in that prison. What, what do all of us have in common? Persecution. The devil doesn't like what we're doing. The world doesn't want to hear the truth of the gospel because the truth goes contrary to the darkness. When I think about the persecution, I'm ashamed when I read many of those missionary books. I'm ashamed when I think, God, I haven't been persecuted like many of these have. I haven't been arrested and thrown in prison. I haven't been beaten like the apostles have. Lord, I haven't been there yet. I haven't been attacked by lions. I haven't been attacked uh, by natives. I was reading the story there of Darrell Champlin when he was uh, in the Congo in 1964 when the Simban uh, rebels attacked uh, the village there and the persecution came and 
some 30 missionaries were martyred and killed and how that uh, his sister-in-law Irene Farrell and 30 missionaries under the Simba rebellion Dr. Paul Carlson was shot uh, for just simply given the gospel of Jesus Christ read the book back there on the table We Too Alone about Irene Farrell when she walked uh, uh, or was drugged out of her missionary compound and, and the uh, rebels uh, shot her and killed her and her co-worker lay at her side and they kicked him and pulled their hair out trying to make sure if they were dead or not. Persecution. Oh, from the first century till now. And could I say to the church, I wonder how bad persecution's going to get before the Lord comes. I'm premillennial, pre-tribulational. I believe God is going to rapture His church before the tribulation. But I often ask myself, how hostile is the world going to get toward Christianity? Isn't it interesting, in the tribulation, when the most persecuted time in the history of mankind is going to take place, and the Holocaust is going to seem like nothing compared to the persecution that's going to come to believers. And what is strange is, when you read the book of Revelation, there's going to be scores of people that come to Christ and come to God more under persecution. I don't know. William Temple said this, Christians are called to the hardest of all tasks, to fight without hatred, to resist without bitterness, and in the end, if God grant it so, to triumph without vindictiveness. Their persecution. Oh, sometimes we think when people make fun of us, or people don't want to take our track, or they laugh at us, that we're really being persecuted for God. Somebody slams a door in our face, or doesn't want to hear the gospel. Oh, we think that's persecution. But notice their praise. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. Now remember, they just been beaten. Remember, they just been commanded. Now, don't go preaching about this Jesus anymore. They beat him. What would you would have done? Would you have been praising the Lord? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You see, I believe that still in the minds of these men the suffering that our Savior went through because of His love for them. And I believe that this stuck in, in Peter's mind as he remembered the suffering of Christ. Listen to what Peter would say in his epistle. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now again, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel. But along with that came the suffering. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was crucified. And Peter heard uh, the Lord when he said in the garden, put up your sword. And he reached down and picked up the ear of the high priest servant and put it back on. And you remember he told Peter that I could summon more than 12 legions of angels. But he didn't. And the writer of, the gospel, uh, of Hebrews tells us, Looking unto Jesus, the author, there's our word, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What joy was that? Endured the cross, despising the shame. When we know what we're doing is pleasing to the Lord, 
that should bring us joy. Even if it means persecution. Even if it means difficulties. Even if it means people making fun of us and trying to hinder us and stop us. That Peter said, oh, it's nothing compared to what God did in the flesh and His Son, Jesus Christ. He, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set Him free, but He didn't. It was God in the flesh. The joy that was set before Him. You see, these men knew that as they were giving the gospel and obeying God, that they could be thankful that they were obeying the Lord. Be thankful. James would say, count it all joy when you fall into divers or, or various kinds of temptations or trials is what he's talking about. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, this kind of praise the world doesn't understand. Uh, the song that we sing, this joy in serving Jesus. I wonder, could they sing that song now? We've been beaten. But what a joy. There's joy in serving Jesus. Hudson Taylor, as he went to the mission field to share the good news of the gospel, four of his children died before the age of 10 years of age. His wife fell sick and she died not long after the death of one of their, giving birth to one of their other children. Hudson Taylor fell as well and was an invalid for a number of months. In the Boxer Rebellion that took place there in China, over 50 missionaries were martyred for their faith. And Hudson Taylor's heart was heavy. But you know what? There was still joy in serving Jesus. Why? Why? Because Paul would sum it up to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. And everything to give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That you and I can have the praise that these fellows had. Knowing that in the midst of persecution and problems, disease, heartache, death of family members, a pandemic that will take those that are precious to us, wipe out our economy, hinder the gospel around the world, we can still, as they said, rejoice. There may be more difficult days ahead and God may test our, our faith even more. Praise God. And then last, notice that their perseverance, their perseverance. Now let me ask you before I read verse 42, if you've been arrested twice, commanded once, beaten once, not to preach or share the good news of the gospel, what would you do? Well, let's see what they did. And daily, in the temple, and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Their perseverance. I mean, they, they continued. You see, witnessing is what we do. We've been given a commission by the commander-in-chief. He's given us orders to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And again, a common denominator of these missionaries on our table and on the other table is their perseverance. 
You know, when I think about these three things in my own life, I, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that I haven't given the Lord more praise in the hard times. I'm ashamed of the, what I thought was persecution and I whined and complained to the Lord. But when I see the perseverance of these men and how that they decided to go back. You see, when you fall, you just get up and you keep going. Someone said, it is a good practice to start each day asking the Lord for wisdom and grace needed to be a loving witness for Christ that day. In other words, it, it means uh, persevering and, and being faithful and seeing it through what God has, has given you to do. And as I think about what God has called us to do and what God has called you to do, Again, there's one missionary that stands out to me on that table that was a missionary that persevered was Adoniram Judson. As he went to Burma to give the gospel of Jesus Christ, the climate was very difficult, the language was an obstacle. The voyage of these missionaries to these countries was they didn't get on a plane and be there in a few hours. It was often days and months. But as Adoniram Judson and his wife Anne had gone there to give the gospel, they ran into persecution, opposition, difficulties, problems. Adoniram stood, the story goes, in the burning heat of Burmese in a July day. It says, staring back at the great temple that overshadowed the entire city, he did not guess the terribleness of the discouragement that waited for him in the muddy streets of Rangoon. He would work 15 hours a day for six full years before he would win a single convert to Jesus Christ. Four years would pass before anyone would even stop to ask about the strange Christianity. That the dismal stench of the rotten air of the tropic would break Anne's health. He would know physical pain as he never had known it before. His second child would die. The first one, Georgiana, was born dead. In all the six years, most Andover graduates of his class were building up tidy little New England congregations and rearing their families in cool, healthy New England air. But to Adnarm, settling into the Felix Carey's house that July, his job seemed simple and clear-cut. He and Anne must master the language, the Burmese language. He said it was so difficult and so hard. He wrote back uh, to a friend years later in July that they were still studying. After, he said, over a year, he said, I knew more French in two months than I know Burmese now, he said. Adoniram agonized in the letter home. He said, preach? He said, convert anyone? He said, they could hardly understand their groceries in this complicated, grammarless mass of strange syllables of the Burmese language. In 1815, still plodding along, drugs that would have helped were undiscovered. Native doctors were only baffled by the white woman's queer reaction to the Burmese weather. He said for a few months, life seemed easier. In September 1814, they heard the good news of the appointment by the Baptist missionaries. And later that month, little Roger Williams Judson was born. A healthy boy who cried a lot and laughed a lot. And then gradually, as his parents 
watched helplessly, lost strength to laugh and to cry. The Burmese climate slowly destroyed him. When Roger was eight months old, he died. They buried him in a little grove of mango trees in the mission garden. For years, he and Ann struggled in Burma. But they were persistent. They persevered. Then in the first week of May, some six years later, a man walked into their village. His name was Mong Na, the first convert. He had been in Burma for over six years. Mong Na was a lumber merchant who worked at the general store labor. He had no family, no money, and no education. But Adoniram Johnson says it seems almost too much to believe that God has begun to manifest His grace to the Burmas. Here's what he wrote in his diary. Praise and glory be to His name forevermore. On June the 27th, 1819, he baptized Mong Na. Adoniram preached with fiercer zest. Another Burma accepted Christ. And then another one. And then another one. But it was through hard times. Perseverance. Persecution. And yes, he continues to give praise to God. Would you bow with me in prayer? Does us good sometimes to read the life of missionaries and others that have gone through so much when we go through so little? And I pray that God would speak to your heart as He did to mine about the persecution in our lives. About the praise that we should be giving to the Lord and about just being persevering through hard times. Lord, thank You for the good news of the Gospel. It's worth being persecuted over. It's worth being arrested over. It's worth being beaten over. And it's worth dying for. So help us, dear Father, in these days that we have it so good to share this good news of the Gospel. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's turn to 694, would you? And sing a verse or two of the...